It has yeah. worms. No, no, no. No, no. Guys, please. You know, I said to people this week, I, I, I put that on because in South Africa, we've got a certain sense of humor. Okay. And I didn't realize I was talking to an international audience. So, so like, I think Ethelin and uh, 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 Merlin thought I actually ate the worms. I just showed the worms because I was in Zimbabwe and Harare, and that's what they eat. So yeah. I think many but you of you said guys that you had them and they were delicious. Don't you be giving us a hard time. Go we read. Know what you, you, said, you need glasses, Sandy. You need glasses. <laughs> I said dinner was lovely. I didn't say I ate the worms. <laughs> 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 read your bible name. no but the, the 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 big thing is you will not believe in that country they don't have the basics and that's what they eat so if you go to any supermarket if you go to any takeaway say for instance like a mcdonald's okay they don't have mcdonald's but it's a similar type thing they will have a burger type thing and then they'll have the worms as well as a side dish literally in every single shop um, so it was. They enjoy them. We don't. So that's fine. Yeah, I <laughs> wouldn't be. Try them. Worms. I, I use them, worms or fishing. Them. You know, when I go fishing, I use worms. Uh, uh, so no, 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 no. But I, I thought, I thought, and 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 it, it's a conversational piece. So guys, please just laugh with me. Please don't disfellowship <laughs> me because I'm eating worms now. <laughs> I know okay, you it's fish. on. And we it's. Used to time so there you go there it is there you go. okay are we ready sandy we go right ahead we'll get you on there We see it. <coughs> okay, let me see. Do you see part of it? Yes. Just make the screen open. Slideshow. Okay. Hi, where do I go from here? See on the top where it says slideshow? Uh-huh. Yeah, just click on from beginning at the, at the bottom left here. Just before your top slide, you can go as well. Come bring your cursor down. Left. So just the beginning. top slide one day says from beginning. Click on that. There we are. Down. There you go. There we are. There we go. Sorry, okay. Keith. <laughs> you were doing the whole thing here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, remember, this is a Sabbath school. I need your opinions, even if they're different than mine. That's what makes the Sabbath school so uh, we can all learn from it. So let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all the blessings you've given us throughout the week. We thank you, Father, for giving us your word and sending the Holy Spirit for, so we can understand it. What a blessing it's been. Thank you in the precious name of Yeshua. Amen. We're going to be looking at uh, the temple this week of the time when Christ came to uh, Jerusalem. And it, and it was a feast day. It was the feast of uh, of. Uh, Passover. So, uh, who would like to start? <clears throat> After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So, my first question to you is, why is it called the Jews' Passover? In Leviticus uh, 23, we're told that these are the feast of the Lord. Yet now it says the Jews pass over. Well, as we continue, we're going to see why this is a, 
This is called the Jews' Passover. The Jewish leaders had instructed the people that at Jerusalem, they, somebody's going to have to, my phone is interrupting me. I'll read it. The Jewish leaders had instructed the people that at Jerusalem, they were to be taught to worship God. Here during the Passover week, large numbers assembled <clears throat> from all parts of Palestine and even from distant lands. The temple courts were filled with a promiscuous throng. Many were unable to bring with them the sacrifices that were to be offered up as test typifying the one great sacrifice. If you notice, this is the Passover. This is the Passover that the Lord put aside. And if you notice at the bottom, when many came, they couldn't bring their sacrifices with them. It was just too heavy. So when they get to the temple, and when they get to Jerusalem, we're told this. For the convenience of these, animals were bought and sold in the outer court of the temple. Here all classes of people assembled to purchase their offerings. Here all foreign money was exchanged for the coin of the sanctuary. Every Jew was required to pay yearly a half shekel as a ransom for his soul, and the money thus collected was used for the support of the temple. So they're selling animals in the courtyard, which they don't need to do because God had put into the law that every Jew was to, was to pay yearly into the temple for the support. The priest didn't need no more money. Everything was taken care of by God. For some reason, I'm happy. Let's I'll continue. read this. Okay, so I'll read this. Exodus 30, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them, when thou numberest them. This they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered. Half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. And half a shekel, the offering of the Lord. Everyone that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. So it's the an Lord, interesting one that, uh, uh, Abel, that yes. it says that only above 20 years. Have you, I've read this one before. Oh, yes, yes. Interesting, eh? And, and we're also, you know, we're told that the Lord took care of the temple. Mm. And besides this. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they gave an offering unto the Lord and make an atonement for your souls. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. It's interesting that people have turned this verse around. They have actually paid money to the church to make an atonement for people that have died to kind of give them a push into heaven. But this was not the atonement money. This, this did not represent what the atonement money was for. We're going to look at, at it in a little while. <clears throat> Besides this, large sums were brought as free will offerings to be deposited <clears throat> in the temple treasury. So if you notice, <clears throat> the Lord has put money into the temple. He's advised the people what to do. The temple did not need any more money, but something was going on in the temple with the priests. And it was required that all foreign coins should be changed for a coin called the temple shekel, which was accepted for the service of the sanctuary. Uh, 
the money changing gave opportunity for fraud and extortion, and it had grown into a disgraceful traffic, which was a source of revenue to the priest. So does this look like the Passover of the Lord? Of course not. This is why it's called the Jewish Passover. They had completely changed everything. It was money. Not the Passover, not the message that God gave through Moses to give to the people of the Passover. It had completely changed. The story of the Passover was be repeated from generation to generation, especially by the priests. How God brought out Israel out of Egypt and protected them. That was the message. Not to make money selling animals. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. This was the message of the Passover. What the Lord did and what the Lord was about to do in the future. But the priests had completely ignored this. And there were, um, it was like a bank or a, a yard sale making money. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what mean ye by this service? That you shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshiped. Yeah, yeah it all pointed to, this, to the Lord's sacrifice, the Lord's uh, um, son. It wasn't the animal that they were selling in the courtyard. They were supposed to be pointing them to the true sacrifice, which wasn't done. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud of darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all night. Yeah, they were to teach the people that God protects us. That was the Passover message. The blessing that God had given Israel. The children of Israel walked upon dry land and in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work that uh, which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Was this being taught? No. It was a disgrace. It was more of an auction, selling animals for profit. So what? Know we uh, that not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? So this spiritualized uh, spir this message. What about our temples? Has Christ gone into our temples and turned the tables over? What do we have in our tables? Are we as bad as the priests at that time? Coming. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glory, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Remember the atonement money? This is what it represents. The price that the, the Son of God, the Father and the Son, paid for us. That's the atonement mo money that symbolizes. <clears throat> Yes, was somebody going to say something? He paid a dear price. The father gave his son. The son gave his life. 
That's the price. That's the atonement money represents. So as, as, as Christ comes in our temple and he begins to drive out many things that we have that needs to be overturned, tables that need to be overturned, he will cleanse it. But sometimes he's got to come back. We pick up the tables and then we have the same thing over again. He comes back to clean it again. But there's a, there's a limit to how many times he will come into our temple and cleanse it. And by disobedient, there's going to come a time when he says, well, you want to go your own way? That's fine. And he will not cleanse our temple anymore because of disobedience. We need to get to the place where everything is clean. There's no selling of animals. Everything is nice and quiet. And we can listen now to the Messiah as he speaks to us in that still small voice as we open the Bible, as we open his word. We can hear as he's speaking to us and instructing us of what is truth after he has cleansed our temple. This is what he does. This is what he wants to do, to teach us, to bring us closer to himself. Get rid of all these idols that we got. Some of us have one, two. Some of us have quite a bit. Some of us have one table that needs to be thrown over. Some of us have a lot of tables that need to be dumped. And like I told many of you, uh, one of my tables, like this table here, I had struggled with alcohol. He came in and threw the table over. And I've, I'll never forget that, that day when, I, when he did this. I know exactly the day he turned that table over. And I never picked it back up. Let's continue. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many arrows. Sorrows. <laughs> so are we in the same state that the priests are? Money? Maybe uh, we need to, uh, money for our temple, even though the Lord has blessed each and every one of us with his presence. The dealers demanded exorbitant prices for the animals sold, and they shared their profits with the priests and rulers, who thus enriched themselves at the expense of the people. The worshippers had been taught to believe that if they did not offer sacrifice, the blessings of God would not rest on their children or their lands. Thus, a high price for the animals could be secured. For after coming so far, the people would not return to their homes without performing the act of devotion for which they had come. Isn't that something? Remember the story of the woman caught in adultery? Did she do a sacrifice? Did she sacrifice? Or did Christ says, neither do I con uh, condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He forgave her. There was no sacrifice. He's the sacrifice. He's the Lamb of God. great number of sacrifices were offered at the time of the Passover, and the sales at the temple were very large. The consequent confusion indicated a noisy cattle market rather than the sacred temple of God. There could be heard sharp bargaining, the lowing of cattle, the bleeding of sheep, the cooing of doves, mingled with the chinking of coin and angry disruptions. Does this sound like the Passover that the Lord put? No. This sounds more like the Passover of the Jews. So great was the confusion that the worshipers were disturbed and the words addressed to the Most High were drowned in the uproar that invaded the temple. You know, it's talking about prayers. Those that were praying at the time could not even pray because of all the noise the temple was a, the, the temple was a place of prayer 
Christ said. Yet it couldn't, it couldn't be done anymore. Too many animals, too much noise, too much confusion. So what about our temple when we pray? Is there confusion in our hearts, our minds? Or uh, are we in direct line with God? Is there anything uh, getting in the way of our prayers to him? This is uh, one of the most powerful weapons we have, prayer, when we talk to God. Is there maybe when we're praying, are we, are we thinking about our work, uh, making money, or it, things coming into our minds, our hearts that shouldn't be there? Our prayer should be directly to God in praise, thanksgiving. Or are we thinking about our work? Maybe we hate our work. You know, I don't want to go to work today. Uh, is there something when we're praying, something else comes into our minds? What, what happens once in a while? I, it happens to me. I'd be praying and something will pop in. And I go, why did that pop in? Or is there so much confusion in our temple when we're praying that the Lord is trying to speak to us? Yet we don't listen. There's too much in our minds. Worldly things, maybe. The Jews were exceedingly proud of their piety. They rejoiced over their temple and regarded a word spoken in its disfavor as blasphemy. They were very rigorous in the performance of ceremonies connected with it, but the love of money had overruled their scruples. So we, hit, so we see here what was going on in the Jewish Passover, the love of money. Can anybody read that? I don't know. I hope sure. it's not too small. Sure, half shekel, the temple tax. In the days of Jesus, all Jewish families gave an annual offering of a silver half shekel to provide for the upkeep of the Jewish temple. Through this contribution came, or though this contribution came to be called the temple tax, it was actually the continuation of the offering that Moses required of the Israelites in Exodus 30, 13. Each one shall give half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. It was this offering, tax, that Jesus himself gave when he instructed Peter to catch a fish in whose mouth he would find a large silver coin that was sufficient to pay both his and, his, and the master's tax. This replica of the temple half shekel will remind you that God will give, that God will even work miracles in order to provide for your needs. Amen. So this, this side here is selling these. And at the bottom, it says this, this will remind you about the miracles. I don't need to buy these to be reminded of the miracles he's done for right. me. But if you see how people are still trying to make money, by using the temple, even today. Anybody? When the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai, the place was consecrated by his presence. Moses was commanded to put bounds around the mount and sanctify it and the word of the lord was hearing was heard in warning take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death there shall not be a hand touch it but he shall surely be stoned or shot through or shot through whether it be beast or man it shall not live isn't that something? Wherever his presence is, it's holy. Thus was taught the lesson that wherever God manifests his presence, the place is holy. The precincts of God's temple should have been regarded as sacred, but in the strife for gain, all this was 
lost sight of. So we know that your body is the temple of God. Your temple is holy. Because God's presence is there. So wherever you go, you're carrying a holy temple. And this is what needs to be in our temple. Not the selling of animals when we, when we uh, celebrate Passover, but what Christ has done for us, what Christ did in the past, what he's doing in, 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 in the future, and what he's doing right now. The priests and rulers were called to be the representatives of God to the nation. <laughs> they should have corrected the abuses of the temple court. So we, uh, we're representatives of our temple. Mm. We need to correct any abuses we have in our temple. If you remember what happened when uh, Moses delayed, Aaron should have never let this happen. But the people pushed them, pushed them. And what happens? Adultery. And we're told, you know, um, Ellen White says that the offerings at the temple at the time of Christ, when he went to Jerusalem, all the offerings that, even though it was blood, uh, blood from animals, it was the same ab abomination that Cain did. God did not accept those sacrifices at the temple when the priests were engaged in money making. It looked, it, she says, it was the same thing as Cain was doing, disobedient. And the result was the same thing that Cain did. But what the priests were doing for money's sake, they were actually kill, killing their brothers and sisters at that time by keeping them away from the true, the true Messiah. It was the same thing that Cain was doing. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So, too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. This is the story. This is a parable. That he told the people, he he knew that this is this is exactly what was happening. The priest, the Levites, had no compassion for the poor, no compassion. There came on, there came to this feast those who were suffering, those who were in want and distress. And if you notice in the story, the parable they was giving, they all passed by this man that needed help. But one, a Samaritan, not only did he help this man that was in, injured, but he went to town and paid for a place for him to stay. He paid for them to take care of him. Something that the priest should have been doing. When all the poor people came to Jerusalem, the priest should have been there to help him. Those that needed help, they had plenty of funds in the treasury. But the priests needed more. They wanted more money. You get a million, you want another one. The blind, the lame, the deaf were there. Some were bought on beds. Many came who were too poor to purchase the humblest offering for the Lord. Too poor even to buy food with which to satisfy their own hunger. Isn't that something? Not even food. But the priests were too busy making money. The priests boasted of their piety. They claimed to be the guardians of the people, but they were without sympathy or compassion. The poor, the sick, the dying made their vain plea for favor. Their suffering awakened no pity in the hearts of the priests. As Jesus came into the temple, he took in the whole scene. 
He saw the unfair transactions. He saw the distress of the poor who thought that without shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness for their sins. Yeah, he saw the faces of the poor. They couldn't afford a lamb or any animal. <clears throat> the priest should have been there to help them. The priest should have gave them doves or, or, or lambs or just to help the poor. But they were very distressed. What are we going to do? How do we get rid of our sins? The Bible tells us, however, that the blood of bulls and goats could not actually take away sins. Hebrews 10, 4. The Old Testament sacrificial system and the high priest was simply a picture that pointed forward to Jesus. Only through the blood of Jesus can we actually have remission of and redemption from our sins. Matthew 26, 28. Colossians 1, 14 and Ephesians 1, 7. This blood cleanses us from all sin. In 1 John 1, 7, through the offering of Jesus' body, we are sanctified once for all. Hebrews 10, 10. Those in the Old Testament looked forward to this, and today we look back at it. Yeah, we're told that, especially uh, um, through Ellen White, that in 1844, a judgment came on those that had passed away which the, the priests were part of that judgment in 1844. Either their sins were blotted out or their names were blot, blotted out. But the priests felt at that time that they were saved, not knowing that the judgment was coming. And today I see, I, I, I understand a lot of people are saying they're saved. But we got to go through the judgment first. Either our names are going to be blotted out or our sins. After your sins are blotted out, then you can truly say, I'm saved. The worshipers offered their sacrifices without understanding that they were typical of the most of the only perfect sacrifice. And among them, unrecognized and unhonored stood the one symbolized by all of their service. So we can only be redeemed by the true lamb, the son of God. Passover is something that is often wrongly overlooked in churches today. After all, it was during the Passover feast that Christ instituted communion and in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, and 7, it says, Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. In the cleansing of the temple, Jesus was announcing his mission as the Messiah and entering upon his work. That temple erected for the abode of the divine presence was designed to be an object lesson for Israel and for the world. From eternal ages, it was God's purpose that every created being, from the bright and holy seraph to man, should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator. Not for uh, having a, a yard sale or <laughs> selling, selling animals. <laughs> I think it's it's right. then, humanity ceased to be a temple for God, darkened and defiled by evil. The heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the divine one. But by the incarnation of the Son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity, and through saving grace, the heart of man becomes again his temple. God designed that the temple at Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high de destiny open to every soul. But the Jews had not understood the significance of the building they regarded with so much pride. 
they did not yield themselves as holy temples for the divine spirit. The courts of the temple at Jerusalem, filled with the tumult of holy traffic, represented all too truly the temple of the heart, defiled by the pr presence of sensual passion and unholy thoughts. In cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the earthly desires, the selfish lusts, the evil habits that corrupt the soul. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. There's a lot of, a lot of tables in our temples, earthly desires, selfish lusts, evil habits, Many tables the Lord needs to come and overturn. So if we let him, he will do it. He'll cleanse us completely. But it's got to be him that cleanses. Slowly descending the steps and raising the scourge of cords gathered up on entering the enclosure, he bids the bargaining company to depart from the precincts of the temple with the zeal and severity he has never before manifested, he overthrows the tables of the money changers. The coins fall, ringing sharply upon the marble pavement. None presume to question his authority. None dare stop to gather up their ill-gotten gain. Panic sweeps over the multitude who feel the overshadowing of his divinity. Cries of terror escape from hundreds of blanched lips. Even the disciples tremble. They are awestruck by the words and manner of Jesus, so unlike his usual demeanor. They remember that it is written of him, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Soon the tumultuous throng with their merchandise are far removed from the temple of the Lord. The courts are free from unholy traffic and the deep silence and solemnity settles upon the scene of confusion. Yeah, if you notice, when he drives everybody out, now people can worship. Now people can pray. This is his um, Passover, his feast. When he drives all, all that are selling, all the priests, drives them out, he stands there in front of the, the poor. Isn't that kind of like uh, separating the wheats and the tares? Oh, yes, yes. Slowly and thoughtfully, but with hate in their hearts, they returned to the temple. But what a change had taken place during their absence. When they fled, the poor remained behind. And these were now looking to Jesus, whose countenance expressed his love and sympathy. With tears in his eyes, he said to the trembling ones around him, Fear not, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me, for this cause came I into the world. See, they were worried that they, had, they didn't have any money to buy animals to sacrifice for their sins. Christ says, fear not, I will deliver thee. It was for the sake of those who should believe on him that these words of Christ were spoken. He knew that they would be repeated, being spoken at the Passover. They would come to the ears of thousands and be carried to all parts of the world. After he, <clears throat> after he had risen from the dead, their meaning would be made plain. To many, they would be conclusive evidence of his divinity. Being spoken at the Passover. You know, it was to be carried to all parts of the world. That's a, that has happened today. You know, we're here in the United States. We got Heinz across the ocean. And this is being repeated. If you remember at the beginning, at the birth of the Messiah, there were was animals, but the end, they weren't selling animals. Everything was nice and quiet. The shepherds came in. They heard the angels singing. There was nothing there like it was at the temple 
at Jerusalem. So I leave you with this. I pray that our temples, that this will be the door for our temples. And that Christ will dwell with us. And I pray that all the tables have been overturned. Let's not pick them back up. So let's have a, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all the blessings you give each and every one of us in our lives. We thank you, Father, for coming in and cleansing us from all, all evil that we have in our hearts and in our minds. Thank you for sending your son to die for our sins. For we ask this in the precious name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abel. That was very good. It oh, was. That was very good. I enjoyed that. It, it was. You know, the Bible says uh, love of money is the root of all evil. And it seems like the goal today is how rich can I get, you know? And years ago, uh, well, I can't think of his name right now. He was asked uh, how much was enough. And he had more than enough to supply him to the end of his days and beyond. And his answer was just a little bit more than what you have. Uh -huh. So they're never satisfied. John D. Rockefeller is the one that said that. Uh -huh. <laughs> Praise the Lord, Abel. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm feeling fed. <laughs> what a blessing. <laughs> amen, amen to that. Good morning, good morning. <laughs> good, uh, good evening over here. <laughs> oh, yeah. right. Good night yeah. over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really appreciated that presentation, Abel. Uh, how how do you exactly um, put together your presentations? Do you, are you just reading through a section of um, of Ellen White and then you uh, of something from the Spirit of Prophecy and then you just sort of prayerfully go over it? Or you know, I really don't know how I do it. I do it. I just get something in my mind, and before I forget it, I put it down. Amen. Amen. I know this. I, I understand just, this. I use a lot of Ellen White because she can explain it a lot better than I can. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't, true. I don't have that gift. I know what I believe, but I, I, I don't know how to explain it. She articulates it so well, right? What you right. want to say, she packages it up in such a perfect way. Yes. Yes. I thought that was really profound when it said that the poor, the poor were still there. And the words that he said there, I said, wow, you know, that to me is so, so profound. Uh, what, you know, it's um, just really touching when you see that those who were rich and apparently religious and, uh, you know, that they're, they're running off. And oh, that yes. these, these humble few that feel like they have nothing, but they're so longing to be at the temple for worship, even though they have no offering. Yeah. Right. It looks like a whole situation. Do you have a video man. on your um, computer now? Oh, yeah. You're talking to me? Yep. All right. Yeah. A black box so. is speaking. There you go. Uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. Is it starting now? We're going to do Psalm 95. Okay, we can uh, wait a couple minutes and then start, unless Keith wants to start right now. It doesn't really matter, I don't think, but you tell me. Thought, go for it. Oh, yeah. Shouldn't we do the fourth commandment? Yeah. At least. I'm just waiting to see if you want.